Today I'm going to talk about um, something we've been working on for a while, uh, and uh, we see that as an essential piece towards this, this upgrading of the internet, a public database for the planet. So um, there, the centralized web, the centralized internet, um, has a lot of challenges. Um, there's one eloquently laid out a lot of these, um, two of them that um, are sort of near and dear to my heart, and to probably many of you in the room as well, are related to creative works and your data. So creative works, um, basically this means that if you create something and you put it out there in the web, um, it gets copied, 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 and well that's fine for sharing and all of that, but what if you are an artist trying to make a living? Uh, how do you get compensated for that? It's really, really hard. Or if you put it out there, um, you know, if you put it on in into Instagram, it's actually you lose the rights, right? But let's say you want to use someone else's work, right? It's nearly impossible often. You do a Google image search and all of that. Um, how do you license that? There's no right-click license. You can go to one data silo like Getty or something and that's fine. But what about more broad sorts of IP to help compensate those creators? So this, it's really sort of backwards. And with, with personal data, right? Um, it's not really yours in many ways. There's walled gardens where you can't really share what you want. Um, and data silos, it, um, if you want to leave one of these walled gardens, you often can't take it with you. Um, you know, is it really yours if it's um, locked up with a key and they don't give you the key, as Cory Doctorow and others like to say? So these are really challenges. There are many others, um, but these are two of the really core ones. So, you know, we've been thinking a lot about what a better, better internet could be like, a better web uh, as layers on top, et cetera. And um, with respect to at least these two things, one of them with creativity. Imagine if creativity itself is encouraged. Imagine if uh, creators themselves are fairly compensated, and that is b nicely balanced with the cultural commons that we want to grow. And there's emerging efforts for this uh, out there, um, things like Creative Commons um, many years ago, more recently things like Project Europeana, the DPLA, the Digital Public Library of America, et cetera, et cetera. It's happening, but it's all s still stored largely in centralized silos. Um, and that's kind of too bad, right? What if the servers for Europeana go down? What if Internet Archive goes down? This is actually like, should we really rely on, on, on all of that? Um, and all, as well on the personal data, right? Um, uh, wouldn't it be cool if you really could truly own and control your personal data? Wouldn't it be cool if you could manage your reputation and take that with you and port it and understand what's going on? Um, and you can really choose what to share. You know, if I go into a bar in the USA, um, I, all I really need to show is that I'm 21 or older. Do they really need to see my name and my address and all this? Uh, why isn't this out there? It's 2016. It really should be straightforward and done in a decentralized way. And there's a whole bunch of other things, too, um, that can be done um, with this sort of infrastructure. Things like equal opportunity for banking. Um, there's, you know, the unbanked, these billions of people out there. And many of all these things related um, to remittance, et cetera. As well as where your atoms come from. This is the idea of provenance, right? When you buy coffee, um, maybe it's fair trade, which is cool. But, um, or you buy diamonds. How do you know that it's a blood diamond? And, you know, throw a rock, it's a piece of atom, but as we look around, all these atoms from where they come around, you know, is it coming from slave labor in some poor country, or, uh, and what can we do about that? How can we learn about the provenance? So these are all opportunities, um, things that we can Im improve upon. So, so for this, how can we improve upon this? And um, what Juan and many others have talked about, and us too, we really care, it's really this shared global compute infrastructure. Uh, Vitalik likes to call it a world computer. I agree. Um, so w what are some of the characteristics of this, right? It's decentralized. No single entity owns or controls. Uh, it's shared. The resources and the control are shared among the participants. It's self-sustaining so that, you know, just like the open source project, if the project goes away, at least it's there out there, right? So self-sustaining such that it can keep going and going and growing if, if it's successful. And um, this is a key constraint, planetary scale, right? So Bitcoin, you know, this sparked a lot of the revolution um, that we have now, which is wonderful, but it really hasn't had the scalability properties needed to serve payments, let alone all the other financial applications on the planet, right? It's, you know, bloated at 50 gigabytes, right? I can store more in my thumb drive in my pocket. So, um, you know, together these properties can, can lead towards some really wonderful things. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the essential components today. So there's actually an emerging infrastructure for this shared global compute. And uh, this is kind of my view of the world. Um, it's a stack, um, very similar to the stack that Juan showed in many ways. Um, and at the very top, we've got applications, um, decentralized applications, dApps. Um, and then one level below, there's different platforms for different sorts of use cases. There's platforms around identity and personal data. Um, you know, just yesterday we saw um, the announcement with Consensus and, and Microsoft and Uport. So that's really wonderful. These things are happening. 
um, we've got stuff related to intellectual property. Uh, this is where kind of we started from with a scribe, um, um, helping artists with uh, creators of digital art um, get compensated and reconciling that with the commons. And there's many other um, startups and projects around there in the space that are really trying to decentralize and desegregate uh, what it means to help compensate creators yet reconcile with the commons. Um, financial, you know, throw a rock and you will find an application of financial technology, right? There's hundreds of applications for um, blockchain, decentralized station, sale technology. Uh, energy, right? Energy dere deregulation at its core means decentralization. So there's many, many applications there. And um, the physical, the supply chain, um, owning physical, physical property. So these are some of the key platforms that are starting to emerge, you know, key use cases. There are, are others as well, but this is really five of the main ones that we've seen. Um, and sort of one level below those applications, there's the processing, right? So this is uh, things like Ethereum, and there's many others too that are out there, uh, Tendermint and Lisk and several others. Um, and it's basically, you know, decentralizing the processing, the state machine that gets updated. Um, and of course, you know, in any modern web stack, and any compute stack at all, you can't just have processing, you need some sort of um, storage, permanent storage layer, et cetera. And if you think about it, it generally comes in two flavors. It comes in file systems and databases. File systems are, you know, UX-wise are organized as a hierarchy of, of directories and files. And they're really to tolerant to partitions. You know, if things get spread apart in planets, then you can still reconcile that interplanetary, right? IPFS, for example. Um, they're really good at handling media blobs. And then there's lower levels to that, things like Swarm and Filecoin, et cetera. On, on the database side, um, there is, um, it, it's different. Rather than the hierarchy of, of directories and files, it's really about queries, right? So, you know, it emerged with the work of Cobb, et cetera, in the 60s and 70s, where we had this, you know, database language, SQL, uh, relational databases. And then there's been an evolution, right, towards NoSQL and all these other wonderful things. One line of database query replaces 50 or 500 lines of, of code, and it's fast, right? Low latency queries, all this sort of thing. Um, and under, underneath, right, it's different. Instead of part partition tolerant, what it emphasizes is a global truth, right? So this is very much like you see in consensus for blockchains, but consensus wasn't invented in the blockchain space. It goes back decades and decades, right? Especially the research um, at SRI and Microsoft in the 80s and 90s, but many other places too. There's a long history here. So this is really for storage. It's really an essential piece of this, uh, and treating storage as a first-class citizen in the decentralized ecosystem really matters. One level below, there is the lower level protocols of TCP IP, and this is also where IPFS is playing a big role. So it's really playing a role in these two places. So overall, I, um, I'm not emphasizing a lot of logos here, but I, I am showing IPFS because it is really working with the existing internet protocols, but there has been a missing piece. And the missing piece um, has been the database, um, the database for the shared global infrastructure. And you might ask, well, Trent, you know, you're with BigchainDB, the, the scalable blockchain database, isn't that it? And the answer is, that's um, a possibility from the software side, but what I'm talking about is the network. What I'm talking about is this resource for the planet. Data as oxygen, database as, as air, right? This is what I'm talking about, that's been missing. So what we've been working on, um, actually going back more than a year, from even before, as part of the vision for, for Big Chain DB, and um, leading towards this is something for the planet. Um, it, we started with the IP. We realized with Ascribe that we needed a scalable blockchain database. We built it. <laughs> and then we realized as well, hey, you know, this can't be something that's just some sort of um, federation of a, a bunch of big entities for some industry. It actually has to be something that's more broad with a vision towards being the, this shared global um, resource. And so we actually um, have spent the time and the energy to bring together um, a, a group of um, entities, of, of organizations, as well as a foundation, and we've created the Interplanetary Database, IPDB. So it sits right next to IPFS, the file system. Um, this is Interplanetary Database. It is oxygen of data for the planet. It is two things. It is a network running a public decentralized database, and it is a nonprofit foundation governed by the network. As a foundation, it's actually a foundation here in Germany, it's an EV, um, and I will talk about the governance shortly, as well as what the network looks like, et cetera. Um, but this is the essence of it, it's two things, it's a network and it's a foundation. So it's the technology and the governance at once. So um, some of the key philosophies here um, of this um, shared public database, it's for everyone, everywhere. Right? It's, it's not exclusionary, it's for everyone, like the internet itself, like these layers on top. Um, how is the usage model, how is this going to look? 
um, we're actually going to be making it free for everybody until you start having heavy usage. This is very much like all the web apps you see today, where there's a freemium model, and then as you get to higher usage, then you have to start paying. So the organizations that take benefit from higher levels, they're the ones that will be covering the costs. Um, the initial technology, just the initial, is BigchainDB. Why? This is our way to get it going. But as a foundation, this is actually something that even um, our company, BigchainDB, we won't be able to control. One year, two years from now, um, it, very, it might have pieces of BigchainDB, but I guarantee there will be pieces of a lot of technology from a lot of you in the audience and elsewhere. And um, one of the key things here, as we've rolled it out, um, w the way that BigchainDB architecture is, it is uh, the path to decentralization is a federation of nodes that vote. And uh, how we're doing it here is with what we call caretakers. So the member caretakers will be operating the validating nodes. Um, this will be decentralizing more and more in the time, as time goes on, not just from a couple dozen um, nodes to start with, but um, hundreds, then thousands, then millions. But we have to walk before we run, and um, this is a path to get to scale now. So what do the caretakers look like? Um, some of the criteria that we've been using have, are, are three things. A long-standing commitment to the decentralized internet. So um, demonstrating a care for archival, demonstrating a care about um, what has been going on in the past, as well as this foundation for the future. Um, at least half have to be nonprofit. Um, this is a, a, a very, very important. What we've seen in many web-oriented organizations and otherwise is capture, right? Um, you know, you talk to the, the founders of, of the DNS, and they're very sad because the registrars now run ICANN. Should we really have dot sucks? So this is really, really important, right? So you really have, have to figure out a way to have this set up where um, dollars are not the main incentive. And finally, um, it, it's really important as well that fewer than half can be from any given country so that it's um, less subject to the whims and the laws of any given country. And ideally, it's very, very distributed with, a, with the users throughout the world. So these are the caretakers that are in this an initial bunch that we have um, spent a lot of time working with, and they've all signed on to this. And, and we're very proud, this has taken a lot of work. These are the people who care, um, who we've been working with, who will be running the initial nodes. There's the not-for-profits, and there's the for-profits. There's a few more that I can't announce today, but these include on um, the not-for-profits, in alphabetical order, Blockstack, which is the one name guys, but they've actually rolled out a foundation. Koala, which is the people who do the blockchain workshops and, and have this vision for standards, et cetera. Uh, Dyn.org, which is um, an open software foundry. Uh, Internet Archive, you, I'm sure you all know, basically they've been swallowing the web since the 90s. Um, you know, Brewster had a vision, and thank God for Brewster, really. So um, it, we're really proud to be working with them. Open Media Foundation, well, open and media, so uh, once again a, mon a non-profit. And on Monastery, which is a really interesting one. Um, monasteries, if you think about it, they are organizations that have been around not just for 100 years or 200 years, but for thousands of years. And Unmonastery is an organization dedicated to bringing monasteries with their super long-term vision into the digital age. So we're very proud to be working with Unmonastery as well. One of our goals actually is to see nodes in every single monastery in the world eventually. Um, as well, on the for-profit side, there's Ascribe slash BigchainDB, of course. Uh, Consensus Industries, one of the main Ethereum spin-offs. Uh, Eris Industries, um, which, um, believe it or not, they really care about the public. You know, a lot of their profile is very private um, um, federation, but if you talk to the guys, and, and they actually have a very strong interest in the public. Uh, Air, um, Protocol Labs, one with IPFS. Um, Smartcontract.com. Um, Sergey and the guys are really thoughtful about governance. They've thought about, about this a ton. Uh, Scenario, uh, which is um, doing blockchain technology as well as identity and reputation, et cetera. And finally, Tendermint, which is one of the, the leading um, organizations thinking about consensus itself. So we're very proud of this or, um, organization of nodes uh, that we put together, uh, really a, a, a federation. Um, and we're, if you think about it, it's kind of cool. I think it might be, um, you know, most of the federations we see so far are around banking and financial. This is one for the commons. This is one for the planet. Right? This is for identity and intellectual property and all of these other things that we care about as humanity. So we're very proud about this. Um, so this is how governance works. Um, the caretakers are at the very heart of it. So in the very center, the caretakers will be able to vote in and out caretakers out of the foundation. And they are operating the validating nodes in the network. So they are really the very heart of this. It's not a scribe, not big chain DB, not IPFS, none of this. It's actually the caretakers. Um, and then the caretakers, they elect a board, and the board um, um, hires day-to-day -day management. The day-to-day -day management to start with will be Greg McMullen, who's um, with Ascribe Big Chain right now, but he will start as the, the founding director, um, the management of, of IPDB. So this is really important. We are um, making a point with 
um, rolling this out, we seed control as quickly as we can. This foundation already exists. The paperwork is there. We've been working on it for several months um, on the legal side. Uh, you might ask, well, maybe this could be a DAO, right? Decentralized autonomous organization. We're like, yes, for sure, we would love that, but we have to walk before we run, right? That will introduce a whole bunch of new ideas, um, and eventually. Um, the roadmap is where we have the test net running now, internally, and then for invited users, and finally for the general public, and then the production net. For um, internally, for invited users, and finally production. Um, sorry, for the, for the public. So walk before we run. Um, this is how we're rolling it out. And wrapping up. So sorry, Harry, I, I understand. So this is IPDB. It's everywhere for everyone. It's toward this better internet for all of us, for personal data, for the cultural commons, commons and creators, and the rest. It's really my pleasure. Thank you for your time. Um, and I hand it over. Thank you.